And we're back now with our four distinguished authors and Ariana Huffington, as you were about to say. I just wanted to defend, really, uh, the state in which so many of my fellow Americans, immigrants and not, find themselves. There is a lot of legitimate anger out there. The sense that somehow the game is rigged, that if you are powerful enough, if you are running institutions that are too big to fail, you can get away with anything. And we never had the equivalent of a Ferdinand Pecora in the 1930s, who could actually run an investigation on what happened and how we got to be where we are, how we got to be in a place where millions of homes are being foreclosed and millions of people are losing their jobs without any real sense of recovery around the corner. And that lack of accountability, that lack of identifying what needs to fundamentally change and how we're going to go about turning our lives and our communities around is, I think, what is perpetuating that anger and putting us in that state um, that Edmund described, which is a very an American state in very profound ways. Bob Woodward, yes. Yeah, well, American politics has always had an anger element in it. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, two-thirds of it is a list of angry grievances against King George III. So I, I think it's a matter of political leaders uh, finding a way to use this in a constructive way. I think that's quite possible. I think the leaders are out there. I wouldn't give up on them just because they're divisions. You and I remember the Nixon era when the piston driving the Nixon presidency was hate. I think now we have a lot of conflict, a lot of disagreement. I don't see hate in our politics, and so in a sense there's been an improvement. You know, uh, uh, Ron, I want to ask you about one of the most fascinating parts of your book. I mean, you make the point that while uh, most of our founders didn't, hire, uh, didn't, didn't hide under a bushel, I mean, they, they let everybody know that they right. thought they were pretty smart right. and made good records of it. George Washington, though, had just the opposite tack. He thought he was more powerful if people knew less about him, so he tended not to tended not to speak unless he just sort of absolutely had to. That's right. I mean, in terms of the other founders, if an Alexander Hamilton were sitting at this table or a John Adams, both of them would be at pains to let us know within seconds that they were the smartest uh, people at the table. Um, Adams, in fact, attributed Washington's power to what he called the gift of silence. And uh, a British diplomat uh, who met Washington once said that Washington was the type of person who, uh, at the end of the evening, Washington would know everything about you and you would know nothing about uh, George Washington. I think Washington is different from the other founders because Washington is impressive when you watch what he does over long periods of time. He's not somebody who sparkles or twinkles in the, in the moment, but he's somebody, uh, when he pursued a goal, um, for in the case of the Revolutionary War, for eight and a half years, he manages to hold this ragged army together in the face of shortages of money, um, men, clothing, shoes, blankets, muskets, gunpowder. It was a it was a phenomenal achievement. But I, you know, there's yeah. one little anecdote I can't let you okay. get away without okay. telling us. It may have been another reason you told us that he was silent a lot of the time? Oh, it was because of his uh, dentures. Uh, by the time that Washington became president, <laughs> he had only one tooth in his mouth. It was a very brave and a very lonely lower left by cuspid, and he had these upper and lower dentures anchored on those, um, uh, on that one tooth. And the upper and lower dentures were connected in the back by curved metal springs. The only way that he could keep the dentures in his mouth uh, by keeping his lips firmly compressed meant that every time he opened his mouth to speak, there was always the possibility that the dentures would fall out, flying out of his mouth. And it may or may not be coincidental that Washington gave many speeches as president that lasted one, two, or three paragraphs. Ariana, long. How, how long do you think a politician would last <laughs> today if they tried to remain silent instead of trying well, to speak at every opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't forget that now politicians have a lot of other ways to communicate beyond speaking and going on television. Look at Sarah Palin, her use of Facebook and Twitter and all the social media which have made it possible for her to communicate without the filters of the mainstream media. So there's a whole new uh, world out there and many politicians are able to use it much more powerfully than others. Edmund, what do you think was the secret uh, Theodore Roosevelt's success. Why was he a good leader? Well, he certainly had no problem in the teeth department. <laughs> good he teeth. Had, strong <laughs> teeth. He had plenty of them. As Somerset Maugham would say, he had more teeth than seemed necessary for any practical purpose. 
<laughs> and his mouth was never still. He loved to talk. Uh, in fact, he was obsessively garrulous, but he was so articulate. He was such a bright man, and his vocabulary was so good. And his speaking style was so forceful that in those days, uh, he prevailed over audience after audience after audience. I think if he was on television now, he would terrify the cameras because he was just so explosively uh, articulate. Bob Woodward, let me ask you this. Uh, what happened to Barack Obama after the campaign? It was one of the most effective campaigns I've ever seen, and somehow after that it seems like he can't catch a break. Whether it's his fault or not, uh, somehow he seems to have lost his groove. Uh, that's true, and I think it's this ambivalence that he has. He, he understands things uh, There is intellectually, but there is not that slogan from the campaign, yes we can. There is all, he, he seems to be holding back. I mean, you're talking about silence and the power of silence. Uh, in the CIA, they often talk about, let the silence suck out the truth. Uh -huh. And you know, as a, a journalist, if you just sit there sometimes and let there become silence, people will fill it up with answers. And many ways, you, you get some of your best answers uh, in that silence. I, I think Obama, it, there it is an uncertain compass in him that he is communicating to people. And uh, the political opposition is taking advantage of it. And uh, the general populace uh, senses it. And so he's going to have to come out and Come, he has to come out with a clear program and statements on all the pressing issues that are on his plate, which are many. Plus, he's not writing his own speeches anymore, which I think he did in the campaign. And uh, he doesn't sound like Barack Obama anymore, whereas when he was campaigning, he sounded really authentic, passionate, and extremely articulate. I think he gets involved in the speeches, but if you look mm -hmm. at the, his day, I mean, the day is crazy, and there, there are so many meetings, there's so many outings, there's so many handshakes, there's so many trips to Ohio and here. Uh, you know, the, as uh, Roosevelt, you always point out, would read a book or two a day, right? Yeah, yeah but presidents, presidents have plenty of spare time. They, sp they waste a lot of time gripping and grinning. <laughs> but I know even from when I was in the White House with Ronald Reagan, he said to me, you know, I meet 80 new people every day. But he still had plenty of time to write his letters by hand and to compose some of his stronger speeches. I have but to stop us there. I'll give you 10 seconds, Ariana. Okay, very quickly. There's a certain reverence for establishments that Barack Obama has demonstrated, whether it's Larry Summers on the economy or uh, the generals when it comes to military policy. And that reverence for establishments has made it very hard for him to really lead. All right. I'm very sorry our clock has struck. Thank you all so much. <laughs>